Welcome to the third video of ITIL 4 Foundation exam preparation questions. My name is Alex from Value Insights and today we're gonna discuss another 10 questions in a flashcard format preparing you for the ETL 4 Foundation exam. Let's have a look at our first question. What is the goal of the monitoring and event management practice? Please pause the video and I will be back shortly with the correct answer. The correct answer for this question is C. It says to observe services and components and to record any changes in their state. Well, this is kind of the purpose statement actually of the monitoring and event management practices. Uh, we want to make sure that we can monitor what is happening in our infrastructure and our services and that we can actually make sense of those things. You know, when something's happening, we need to categorize those events and we need to make sure that we understand what to do with those. You know, it could be informational type of events, it could be warning events, but it could also be exceptions, you know, like incidents that something broke and we need to fix it. A is uh, to protect the information that an organization needs for business. Well, that would be the information security management practice. Then we have to restore normal service operation as soon as possible, which would be the incident management practice. And to provide accurate and reliable information about CIs when needed, that would be the configuration management practice. Question number two, you have been tasked with the setup of an internal service desk in the small company you work for. Ensuring that the right tools and applications will be used by the team is a consideration of which service management dimension. Let's give it a thought and I will tell you the correct answer in a minute. The correct one for this is A, it's information and technology because that is what it is about, exactly this. It's about understanding what technological stuff, what tools and what information we need to be able to run or make our new initiative work. So if we want to build up a new service desk, we need to think about all the tools, also the computers, also the information, you know, like building up a knowledge base, which tool to use for building up a knowledge base, how to handle incoming calls, what type of phones we want to have, which type of video and audio conferencing software do we want to use, and so on. Partners and suppliers, would be true if we are thinking about which partners could supply us with these things you know what uh, vendor companies are there on the market which best fit our profile and our needs organization and people would consider uh, the knowledge and the human resources that would be necessary to run this new service desk how many people do we want to hire what type what kind of skills do they need what languages do they need to speak and so on and value streams and processes would consider how the work would be organized on the service desk. What would be the things that the service desk should do, like password resets, or maybe it's just a catch and dispatch service desk and it just takes the tickets and sends it to the next uh, support levels. So the correct answer for this one is A, information and technology. Next question, how does the service desk practice support the deliver and support service value chain activity? Please pause the video and I'll be back shortly. The correct answer for this one is D. It says the service desk acts as a central coordination point for the handling of incidents and service requests. And so it is, right? It should be the, the Spock, the single point of contact or at least the single point of entry for all types of user requests that are coming into the IT organization mainly talking about incidents and service requests but not necessarily only it could also handle changes or problem tickets it surely depends on how you set up your service desk but by default it's about incident and service request handling and acting as a as a main entry point quest is done which is not true because there will be any support team who is involved in the change enablement practice B says by enabling the organization to select the right vendors not true because that will be the supplier management practice and C says, by allowing the service desk agents to handle all access requests, still not true. It might be the case, but usually not everything is handled by the service desk. There might be setups where certain second level teams or certain expert teams in your organization handle access requests as well. Let's have a look at this one. Why is customer engagement crucial for the service level management practice? Ooh, this is a nice question. So let's give it a thought and I'll tell you the correct answer in a sec. And the correct one for this would be C. Let's have a look. Why? Because it says 
It captures information on which metrics can be based. And it's so true. We need to engage with our customers to understand what is important for them. You know, we need to find out what is valuable. And then when we are setting up our SLAs and our KPIs, our metrics, we can base these metrics on the information that the customer engagement delivers to us, right? We talk to the customers, we understand what they want, and then we can build meaningful metrics to measure that they get what they need. A says it defines who is allowed to open incident tickets from the customer organization. Well, not true because that's definitely everybody. B says it ensures that we meet the agreed service levels. Not true because that would be the service level management practice itself and the reporting that is done within the practice and all the people who are involved in the practice actually like the service level manager, but even the service desk team leads, even the service desk agents would be involved in that. And this says it defines the workflow for service requests. Well, not true because that is the service request management practice. Let's have a look at question number five. Why is it important to categorize incident tickets? Please pause again and I will tell you the answer in a minute. Okay, doke. The correct one for this would be B. It says it gives us the possibility to identify trends which might trigger the provision of permanent solutions via problem management and change enablement. And that is the correct one because if we can categorize incidents, right, we have the possibility to run some meaningful reporting and identify if there are recurring incidents on the same configuration items or maybe the same applications are down all the time or maybe it's the same services affected. And then we can run a root cause analysis through problem management, find out what is happening. And then maybe we need to open a change request to get this solved for good. It's a measure of quality. Well, it might be a measure of quality and it might be a requirement for most customers, but it's still not true. I mean, ITIL doesn't talk about we need to do something because it's a requirement for most customers. C says, if it is not done, we don't know which customer opens the most tickets. <laughs> well, yeah, it doesn't make any sense because actually we have uh, the possibility to run reports on the people, on the names, right, to open tickets. But in the end, it's not even, a, most of the times, it's not even a relevant um, a metric that we want to measure. And this says neglecting the categorization might cause financial penalties if organizations get controlled by external auditor companies, which might be the case. But again, ITIL doesn't talk about that. So we should do the categorization to have a possibility of uh, identifying trends. So the correct answer is B again. The next question says the handling of user feedbacks, compliments and complaints is a responsibility of which practice? Let's give it a good thought and I'll tell you in a sec. The correct one here is B. Whoa, it's a tricky one, right? Because A says a service desk, which is kind of very close to the truth. But it's not only about feedbacks, complaints and uh, compliments. A service desk also handles incidents and maybe even other types of tickets like changes or problems. So the correct one is service request management because all types of feedbacks, compliments and complaints because they are not incidents, because they are not changes, not problems. That's why they are handled by the service request management practice. And still the service desk does it most of the time, but not only. It could also be that a certain special team handles all user feedbacks, uh, compliments and complaints like a quality team or something like that. So that's why B is the correct answer. Incident management will be handling all the incidents and problem management all the problems, so they are kind of easy to close out. How does the service request management practice support the engage service value chain activity? Let's give it a thought and I'll tell you in a minute. The correct one for this would be A. A says by providing regular communication to users to gather requirements, set expectations, and to provide updates. That is all the engagement that is happening in service request management. If it's the service desk who does it, or if it's other support teams who do it, but it's all about uh, the engagement around service requests to understand what the customer needs and also to set expectations, you know, like to tell them, um, what to expect regarding the resolution times of service requests because that's usually more than with incidents. Our SLAs allow us usually more time to get service requests done. Yeah, and also to provide updates because there will be customers who will be asking like, mm, I've ordered a laptop, when do I finally receive it? And then uh, service request management says, yeah, it's going to be in, I don't know, two weeks or depending on the vendor or our stock. 
B says by handling all user initiated service requests and incidents. That is not true because that would be the service desk and it would do it in the um, deliver and support service via chain activity and not an engage. C says by communicating uh, known errors to the user community, not true because that would be the problem management practice, but it would be an engage. And D says by handling the distribution of incoming calls at the service desk, that wouldn't be a practice. It would be usually a tool like some kind of call center application that would make sure that you know agents get the calls based on their skills and availability. So the correct answer in this case is A. Let's have a look at the next question. Which of the following is true for change authorization? I like this question, so let's give it a thought and I will tell you the correct answer in a sec. The correct answer for this question is C, which says each change model and type should have its own change authority. Because a change authority is not a predefined person or anything like that, but it needs to be defined based on a type of change. If we have a more significant type of change, it might uh, need to be a, a separate team, like a change advisory board who needs to approve it, like the IT management team or something like that. But if it's a small change, it might be even one single person, maybe some, somebody in the team who can approve it. So that's the concept of decentralized decision making, which is promoted in all agile methodologies and frameworks. A says changes should be authorized by one person to speed up the process and to reduce dependencies. Well, we might certainly reduce dependencies, but what happens if that person doesn't have the technical knowledge to approve? Or what if that person is on vacation or maybe that person is sick? The whole process is halted again, so we shouldn't do that. B says normal changes must be authorized quickly as they require fast actions. Not true because there will be emergency changes. And D says standard changes have a high risk and need to be approved by the management. Again, not true because standard changes are the exact opposite. They are low cost, low risk, pre-approved changes. Usually something like service requests, stuff that happens all the time that doesn't need to be approved individually every time somebody opens a standard change. So correct answer again is C. Question number nine, which is true for problems and known errors? Let's give it a thought and I will tell you the answer in a sec. The correct answer for this one is A. It says a problem is called a known error once the root cause has been identified. That is exactly it. A problem by definition is the unknown cause of one or more incidents. And then we start analyzing it because we don't know what's causing it, right? Unknown cause. So we start analyzing what the problem uh, is and then we find something that is causing it. You know, we find a root cause. We cannot call it a problem anymore because it's not the unknown cause of incidents anymore. It's now the known cause and that's why we call it a known error. That's the official term. So once we identify the cause of a problem, it's a known error. B says problems are handled by technical stuff while known errors are handled by the service desk. Not true because even a service desk could handle problems and also the second level or technical staff uh, could also create known errors which are then made available for the service desk uh, which are then made available for communication to the end users. C uh, says a problem is the cause of one or more known errors. Not true at all because a problem is the unknown cause of one or more incidents. D says problems can be closed once they have become known errors. Not true because it just means that we have identified the root cause, which is already a great step, but we still need to solve it. And we might even need to involve a change enablement to get this uh, permanently solved. And again, we have arrived at our last question. The decision about which vendors to engage with is influenced mostly by which of the following statements here. Okay, let's give it a good thought and I will tell you this one as well in a minute. And the correct one here is B. It is about the culture of the service provider organization. We need to think about our vendors as partners with whom we need to engage a lot and we need to have we need to select vendors with whom we can work well together. So if we have the possibility to choose because there are vendors with, with, with similar offerings, we should always go for the one which fits best into our organizational, into our corporate culture, because that would ease the engagement with them a lot. 
It says the level of formality in the organization, which is actually part of the culture as well somehow, but it's not the main um, reason on, on which we should base the selection of our vendors. Because that's simply not enough just because we are very formal doesn't mean that we need to go for a very formal vendor. It's more about the cultural aspect as said before. C says the contracts that the organization has with its own customers. Well, it's, it's true at some point, but it's, let's say it like this. We should make sure that the contracts which we have with our vendors, once we selected them, they should uh, support the SLAs that we have with our own customers. But it's not about the selection at all. It's, it's not about what type of vendor or which vendor we select. It's just about um, how we define the contracts, the underpinning contracts with our vendors. That is influenced by the contracts we have with our uh, own customers. And D says the financial strategy of the service provider organization, well, it might have an effect on which vendors we select because we might have a strategy to, to, to always go for the cheapest one. But that is certainly not a good practice and, and, and not even a best practice. So we shouldn't do that. This is it again. Thank you very much for watching this video. I really, really hope you liked it. Please give it a thumbs up if so and share it with your colleagues um, or anybody who is interested in passing the ITIL4 Foundation exam. If you have any feedback, we would very much appreciate if you could uh, leave us a comment or send us an email or go to our webpage and chat with us. We are happy to help you on any channel that we have available. We wish you all the best and hope to see you around in our next video. Value Insights. Agile by vision, trainers by passion.